We arrive now at the appendix to the transcendental dialectic, which in the Geyer and Wood translation that I am using, um, unfortunately has the header, section 7, critique of all speculative theology, as if this still belonged to section 7, critique of all speculative theology of the ideal of pure reason. Uh, but it doesn't, right? It's an appendix to the transcendental dialectic as a whole. It contains of two parts, the first of which is called On the Regulative Use of the Ideas of Pure Reason, and the second of which is called, if I can find the title, yes, On the Final Aim of the Natural Dialectic of Human Reason. The first of these two sections is certainly quite interesting, um, in the sense that Kant is going to tell us more, and also in a more detailed way, about how he thinks reason works in actual scientific practice. Right? He's sort of really starting to set out some of the principles of his philosophy of science here. The second part on the final aim of the natural dialectic of human reason is, to be honest, quite long and not so much new stuff happens in it. Okay, so let's look at both of these sections. On the regulated views of the ideas of pure reason, one of the first things that is said in it at the bottom of A642 is the following. Everything grounded in the nature of our powers must be purposive and consistent with their correct use. Right? Everything grounded in the nature of our powers must be purposive and consistent with their correct use. This, I'm tempted to say, is one of the most fundamental presuppositions of the entire critique of pure reason. Right? Kant has been, I mean, really, the entire project is based on the idea that reason must be able to understand itself, that our mental powers can understand themselves and can then be used to get to the end point, which is knowledge, right? that to which they are suited, cognition. Um, it's good that Kant sort of reiterates or, 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 or states that so clearly here. Um, of course, it is possible for a philosopher to deny this, or at least to question this. And I think that certain thinkers who come later, and you know, one, one thinker who immediately pops up in my mind is Friedrich Nietzsche, um, would say, no, I mean, why do you believe this? Right? Our, maybe our ways of thinking are completely unsuitable to understanding the world are you know not even consistent and so on and so forth anyway that's not the way kant thinks in a very fundamental sense kant is an optimist about human understanding human reason human cognitive powers they must be purposive they must be consistent with their correct use so insofar as the dialectic has been trying to show us where reason goes wrong Clearly, Kant wants to say that reason can also go right, and that reason rightly used necessarily goes right. And we have also seen already, again and again, what the right use of reason consists in. Right? The right use of reason is to take these transcendental ideas not as hypostasized, really existing beings, but to take them as regulative principles that tell us how to conduct our you know, attempt to, to know and understand the world. So here is one thing that, that Kant says about that. Um, around A644, the beginning of A644, Kant says, Thus reason really has as object only the understanding, and its purposive application, uh, as is, uh, sorry, thus reason really has as object only the understanding and its purposive application, and just as the understanding unites the manifold into an object through concepts, so reason on its side unites the manifold of concepts through ideas by positing a certain collective unity as the goal of the understanding's actions, which are otherwise concerned only with distributive unity. So the understanding posits the object as a sort of um, locus of unity of of you know, sensation. Reason posits the world and God and the soul as a sort of locus of unity of everything that the understanding is doing. So there's, there's an analogy there between reason and the understanding. 
So Kant goes on to tell us that um, reason is really after the systematic inclination, that this always presupposes an idea, namely that of the form of the whole of cognition, uh, and so on and so forth. Here is something I think is really interesting. At the bottom of A651, Kant tells us the following. He says, for the law of reason to seek unity is necessary. Right? We, we might think, okay, we have the understanding. What do we need reason for? Right? I mean, is reason maybe not superfluous? If it brings us into all of these illusions, couldn't we just dispense of, with reason, dispose of reason, and just use the understanding? Absolutely not, Kant is going to tell us. For the law of reason to seek unity is necessary, since without it we would have no reason, and without that no coherent use of the understanding, and lacking that, no sufficient mark of empirical truth. Thus, in regard to the latter, we simply have to presuppose the systematic unity of nature as objectively valid and necessary. So, what the understanding is trying to get at is truth, empirical truth. Right? Empirical truth about the world. That's what the judgments of the understanding are supposed to give us. But there is no mark of empirical truth, Kant tells us, without reason. Because it's reason that takes all these judgments of the understanding and brings them together and seeks for unity and checks one against the other. And as we have already seen multiple times in the book, right, the very distinction between a true empirical judgment and something like an empirical illusion uh, or an empirical mistake is that the illusion or the mistake or the dream do not fit the unity of the judgments of the understanding. Right. So it is only because we have reason which goes beyond any single judgment but brings them together and tries to make a unity out of them. It is only because we have reason that we have what we need in order to even make sense of the idea of empirical truth. And if we can't make sense of the idea of empirical truth, we can't make sense of the understanding. There is no purpose to the understanding if it's not the purpose of getting to empirical truth. So the understanding needs a reason just as much as reason needs the understanding. So we cannot dispense with reason. Like it's not some optional extra, right? That is what I take to be the burden of this little but very, very crucial passage in Kant. Okay, so what Kant is going to do, to do in the next couple of pages is he is going to work out the ways that reason actually acts in our scientific projects, right? When we do science, how are we going to find these, these, you know, what kinds of principles of reason are we going to find there? And one of the things that Kant is really interested in is talking about the relation between species and genera, right? And so this is maybe kind of a, in some ways, a sort of old fashioned way of thinking, although, of course, we still see it in biology. The idea would be that, you know, you have species and those species, you know, kinds of things belong to higher genera, to sort of higher up levels of organization. So for instance, um, I don't know, the, um, I, I really should have, have, you know, looked up some, some nice biological examples, but we can, you know, crocodiles and snakes, for instance, you know, snakes, there are lots and lots of types of snakes, right? There are rattlesnakes and there are boa constrictors or boas constrictor maybe. Um, so these are all species of snakes, but they all belong to the higher up genera, um, to the uh, genus, I should say, the higher up genus of snake. Now we have snakes and crocodiles, and those two belong to an even higher genus of reptiles. And we have reptiles and mammals, which belong to an even higher genus of animals. And we have animals and plants which belong to it, well, and so on and so forth, right? We have this whole hierarchy. And what Kant is telling us is that reason demands of us both that we always look for further subdivisions of the species and that we look for further unity into higher and higher genera and that we need both of these. 
right? If we were only to look for unity sort of higher up, then we would turn into thinkers like maybe Parmenides, who say that all is one. Um, if we just look like for the empirical richness and wealth of, of all the individuals, we turn into somebody like, I don't know, Nietzsche. This is just one comment by Nietzsche, but who says that, you know, no two things really belong to the same, to the same category. Uh, everything is unique. Heraclitus, maybe I should take Heraclitus and Parmenides as the, um, as the two opposed poles here. Uh, we need both, Kant is going to tell us, right? If we want to do science, if we want to understand the world, we need to balance these two requirements or pursue them both, as well as a sort of third requirement that binds them together, the notion of affinity, which is basically the notion that from any element of this hierarchy, we can get to any other element in a sort of continuous fashion. And so the hierarchy is one hierarchy, right? A, a one hierarchy which you know allows us to um, see a unity in the diversity. So that is why Kant tells us that we have homogeneity, specification, and continuity. And he, um, you know, has some reflections on that, uh, how to do it, uh, how you can recognize maybe different types of thinkers in science, and so on and so forth. I'm not going to talk about that in, in too much detail, not more than I've already done. Um, let me just point at the introduction of the word maxim at the very end of this part of the critique. This is A666. Almost uh, like around the beginning of A666, Kant says this, the principles of pure reason will also have objective reality in regard to this object, yet not so as to determine something in it, but only to indicate the procedure in accordance with which the empirical and determined use of the understanding and experience can be brought into thoroughgoing agreement with itself by bringing it as far as possible into connection with the principle of thoroughgoing unity. As far as possible, right? That's what reason tells us to do. Go as far as possible um, and always assume that there's even more possible than what you've already done. But don't jump to the end point without doing the work. Right? That's, don't, don't claim that you know something about this last stage, this infinite or total stage. Um, I call all subjective principles that are taken not from the constitution of the object, but from the interest of reason in regard to a certain possible perfection of the cognition of this object, maxims of reason. Thus, there are maxims of speculative reason, which rest solely on reason's speculative interest even though it may seem as if they were objective principles. And so principles like always seek for the unity um, of appearances, but also always pursue the maximum specificity. We might mistake those for objective principles, right? Principles which say that nature is simple or that nature is diverse or that nature is continuous, but they're maxims. They have to do with the interest of reason um, they prescribe, we prescribe to ourselves, or reason prescribes to itself, a certain activity, a certain way of proceeding. And I wanted to lift out this word maxim here, um, and this idea of maxims of speculative reason, because the term maxim is going to be very, very important in Kant's practical philosophy. Right? When it comes to the categorical imperative and stuff like that, maxims are going to be um, a crucial term, though, of course, those maxims, the moral maxims, will be maxims not of speculative reason, but of practical reason. All right, so the very last part of the dialectic is then on the final aim of the natural dialectic of human reason. Here, Kant says that he's going to do something a little bit like giving a transcendental deduction of the ideas of reason. Basically, what he's going to do is he's going to tell us that uh, the soul and God, yeah, you know, absolutely assume them, right? Assume the soul and assume God, but in a special way. So at A670, Kant makes a distinction between um, something being given to my reason as an object absolutely or only as an object in the idea. 
and we have to assume the soul and God as objects in the idea, which basically means that we have to proceed as if there is a soul, I have a soul, as if the world was created by a God. Um, that is something that reason sort of pushes us to do. Uh, it's sort of necessary for reason. There's nothing against it. It's, it's, it's a precondition for the highest, po highest success of our speculative projects. And so we have to do it. But, of course, not make the mistake of thinking that the object has been given to us. Absolutely. Okay. Only soul and, the go and God, by the way. Why not the world? Well, because positing the world uh, like this sum total of experience, that is actually, you know, leads us into contradiction. Right? That is in itself um, a mistake because it mistakes the world of experience for a thing in itself that is determined in itself. So we can't really do that. If we do it, we get back into all the problems of the antinomy. So Kant actually believes that there is a, an important asymmetry between, on the one hand, the world, this cosmological idea, and on the other hand, the soul and God, these other two ideas of reason. Right, let's see. Maybe we can look for a moment at Kant's, well, almost catechismus. He has some, some interesting stuff about how to use the concept of God in science, right? Some mistakes that we can make. Right. We should not say like, oh, everything happens because it's the will of God. Um, why was there an earthquake? Will of God. That's wrong because, well, basically because we are not thinking of, we're just thinking of this one event and relating that one event to this highest principle, this ideal of reason. Um, whereas we should actually take all of nature and relate it to the ideal of uh, of. Uh, uh, this ideal of reason to God and ask, okay, you know, all of nature has to be this, this wise unity. And so this earthquake has to fit into the whole scheme of nature, right? And that's, that's the form of scientific inquiry, not saying, ah, the earthquake happened because God wanted it, but saying, hmm, you know, the entire um, structure of nature is as it is because a wise creator has made it. So let's find the laws that underlie even this earthquake, right? So, so Kant wants us to um, wants us to use something like the idea of God in a way that is actually useful to science. Okay, what do I call Kant's catechismus? Um, it is the stuff that he starts doing around a six nine six, right, where he has these questions and answers, just like in the catechismus. Thus, if one asks, uh, thus if one asks first whether there is anything different from the world which contains the ground of the world order and its connection according to universal laws, then the answer is without a doubt. For the world is a sum of appearances, and so there has to be some transcendental ground for it. If the question is second whether this being is substance of the greatest reality necessary, etc., then I answer that this question has no significance at all for all the categories through which I attempt to frame a concept of such an object are of non but empirical use. Um, we, we have seen this coming, right? I mean, Kant is gonna say, yes, there is a transcendental object, right? There is a thing in itself. There is something beyond the world of experience. Yeah, but we can't use the categories to talk about it. Okay, that's one and two. Number three, if the question is third, whether we may not at least think this being different from the world in accordance with an analogy with objects of experience, then the answer is by all means, right? You're allowed to do it, but only as object in the idea and not in reality, namely only insofar as it is a substratum unknown to us of the systematic unity, order and purposiveness of the world's arrangement, which reason has to make into a regulated principle of its investigation of nature. Yes, assume God, like, as, you know, analogous to an intelligence, to a wise creator. But don't forget that you're just doing this in order to posit it as the necessary correlate to our scientific modes of investigation. 
Can we assume a unique, wise and all-powerful world author without any doubt? And not only that, but we must presuppose such a being. But then do we extend our cognition beyond the field of possible experience? By no means, because we do all of this in accordance with the analogy. Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, not, not much new things are happening maybe in this part, uh, this little part of the critique. But it wraps up the kind of things that we've been seeing in the dialectic and, by the way, in the analytic quite well. And with that, we come to the end of the first of the two parts of the critique of pure reason. Uh, obviously, we've done already most of the book, but all of this was still the transcendental doctrine of elements in which we talked about sensibility, the understanding and reason. Now we come to the transcendental doctrine of method, which is kind of a methodological reflection, um, contains some assorted topics and is stuff that we're going to delve into very soon. But first I want to make a video about um, the transcendental idealism as a whole, right? Having seen the aesthetic, the analytic and the dialectic, what do we know about transcendental idealism? And I'm going to discuss Gardner's chapter about that in our next video.